warm welcome starting first baptism of the year. I want to invite up here Pastor Freddie. Um, he also is a pastor over the years, just like me. He, he's been waiting on the Lord just to see what God would say about 2023. So see this as a, kind of, see this as a prophetic word. Um, my prophetic word was last week. It's my preach. <laughs> The whole, the whole thing is a, a prophecy, uh, in a sense, prophetic preaching. And uh, Pastor Freddie has really got a gem here. So let, give him all your ears. So Pastor Freddie, please come and share what the Lord has put in your heart. Good on you, bro. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I just want to, just uh, as an explanation to this, because I know at this time, lots of people come out of the woodwork and say all sorts of things, what they think God is saying. And so really subtitle this, the way I see it, therefore I give you permission not to see it the same way. Is that okay? Because, the, uh, and as Pastor Rob said, I've, over the years, I've sought God for what word. I remember uh, the last church and then at the end of the first year, I was contacted by the secretary saying, we have a motto, are we still going to do this? And I said, I'll get back to you. And I said, Jesus, are we still going to do this? And each year, God gave me a word. And you know that New Hope uh, didn't have its own building. And the one year, the word was, this is the year of the open door. And that was the year we had our building. And we step through the doors and the rest, as they say, is history. So I'm just going to read this to you. If you want it, email me, text me, and I'll send it to you. This is also a version of this. It is on my YouTube channel already. And I've called it Stepping Up. Um, so I'm just going to read it, okay? 2023 is the time for stepping up, staying up, and bringing others up. For such a time as this, and you might say, what time is it? Well, it's a time of confusion, it's a time of compromise, and we see it's a time of the carnage of war across Europe and other places. And so it's certainly not a time, uh, it's a time to step up and not step down. It's a time to come up higher. When Peter, James, and John went up into the mountain with Jesus, they saw him transfigured, Matthew 17. And we, through prayer and fasting and study of the word, come up higher and will notice that the things of the earth will grow strangely dim. And... Uh, they will go dim in comparison. And as the vision concludes, the Bible records that they saw no one but Jesus. Therefore, no matter what revelation you have, no matter what vision you get, or God wants us to make Jesus our main focus in 2023. It's a, yeah. It's a time to step up to single-mindedness, focus, and emulate the Apostle Paul's emphasis and say, one thing I do. One thing I do. You see, 2023 is not a time for blending in, but rather a time for speaking out. It's a time to step up, stand out, whatever the cost. It's a time to step up to a higher place. It's, a, it's illustrated in the book of Revelation where John hears the voice saying, come up here, Revelation 4.1. And among other things, this is to enable John to see from God's perspective. See from God's perspective. There's so many opinions. Let's see from God's perspective. I'll stop it getting into a preacher. <laughs> I believe that in 2023, we need to step up to a higher realm because even amid the confusion, when men's hearts are failing through fear, there is clarity in this higher place. The Bible clearly states the believer is positionally seated with Christ in heavenly realms. 
Therefore, we, may we live this out in our daily lives throughout the year. So let me encourage you to step up in 2023. Step up in prayer, praise, worship. Step up in your study of the word, in preparation, signing up for the Bible school, all those things, Proc and proclamation of the word, and continually be proactive. Sorry about the tongue twisters. So may we step up, stay up, and bring others up with us. Amen. Thank you, Freddie. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks for that. Uh... Thanks for that, Freddie. Right, so as I mentioned last week, um, as I mentioned last week, that uh, all the messages throughout January are going to be based on the theme in Isaiah 58. Uh, if you know your Bible, you'll know that Isaiah 58 is kind of subtitled God's Chosen Fast. And it's in contrast to the fasting that God's people. 700 years before Jesus, the kind of fasting they were engaging in, which is a kind of tick box religious exercise. And um, to open up today's message, which follows on, I do want to read to you uh, Isaiah 58. Now, I, I don't think we've got that, uh, Hannah. So I'm going to read this out to you. So Isaiah 58, and I'm going to read this from the New Living Translation. So Isaiah 58, five messages preached by, how many preachers were it? Four this month. Four different preachers this month. I'm having a holiday. So Isaiah 58 verses 1 through 5. This, this is what I feel God is saying to this church. And this church is made up of all of you. So it's not just about, don't lose yourself in the kind of corporate context. You make up the corporate context. Yeah? So Isaiah 58, 1 through to 5. What was God saying to his Old Testament people? If you want to read this in your own Bible, which I hope you've either brought it on your phone or a paper copy. Here we go. God speaking through the prophet. Shout with the voice of a trumpet blast. Shout aloud. Don't be timid. Tell my people Israel of their sins. Ooh, they didn't think they had any. Yet they act so pious. They come to the temple every day. Come to Suncoast Church every week. And they seem delighted to learn all about me. They act like a righteous nation that would never abandon the laws of its God. And they ask me to take action on their behalf, pretending they want me to be near. We have fasted before you, they say. Why aren't you impressed? We've been very hard on ourselves. And you don't even notice it. So, as I said last week, how many of us have at least been tempted to say, as we've read our Bibles, as we've done our prayer time, as we've come to church, as we've given to the church and whatever else, and we've maybe even fasted, and life has got difficult, and then we feel we can say to God, when are you going to do your part? When are you, I've done my bit, when are you going to do your bit? And this is what their attitude was. And God is saying, as a, I'll, read, I'll read on. I'll tell you why. That's what comes next. I'll tell you why. Now, there's other reasons why the answers to prayer don't come instantly. How many know God likes to exercise patience? He has a timing for these things. But sometimes it's because of this. Sometimes it's because we've got to sell, and I'm going to really unpack this over the next half hour, it's because we've lapsed into churchianity rather than Christianity. And we haven't even realized, just like these guys 700 years before Christ, and as you will see, even in the day of Christ, and even as you will see in the New Testament church, 50 years later, 40 years later, same problem. People had lapsed into churchianity Instead of Christianity. Amen? So God says, I'll tell you why. It's because you're fasting to please yourselves. It's not about humility. It's not about dependence. It's not about praise and worship. It's about, I'll, do, I'll take that box and I'll twist your arm 
so that you do what I want you to do. That is just not what fasting's about. I unpacked that last week. I'm not going to do it this week. So he says, even while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep on fighting and quarreling? I mean, in fasting, you can get hangry. You need to watch that if you're husband and wife and you're fasting together. This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves and then it goes, this is the way it renders it in the uh, New Living Translation. He says, you humble yourselves by going through the motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap sackcloth and you cover yourself with ashes. Is this what you call fasting, God says? Do you really think this will please the Lord? No, this is the kind of fasting I want. Listen to this. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free and remove the chains that bind people. And this is slavery of every kind. Not just slavery, physical slavery, but how many know anything, anything that you're addicted to, you have no control over, you're a slave to that. He says, share your food with the hungry. And give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from your relatives who need your help. Then your salvation will come like the dawn. They were looking for God to move in their behalf. Then your salvation will come like the dawn, a new day. And your wounds will quickly heal. Your God, I mean, a churchianity will never get you healed. Either physically or physically. Soulishly, emotionally, psychologically, relationally, whatever. It just never will do it. And your wounds, your wounds will quickly heal. Your, sorry, your godliness will lead you forward. And the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, then when you call, the Lord will answer, Yes, I'm here. He will quickly reply. Who wants that? <laughs> Remove the heavy yoke of oppression. Stop pointing your finger and spreading vicious rumors. Wow. Feed the hungry and help those in trouble. Then your salvation will do come like the dawn. Why is that repeating? Is it? Yeah, it has. Why is part three repeating that? Anyway, let's go on. Um, I must have gone back to that. Uh, yes. Then your light will shine out from the darkness. Verse 10. And the darkness around you will be as bright as noon. The Lord will guide you continually. And giving you water when you are dry. And restoring your strength. And you will be like a watered garden. Like an ever flowing spring. Some of you will rebuild the deserted ruins of your cities. You think about that socially in so many ways. So much dysfunction in life today in families, marriages. Then you will be known as a rebuilder of walls. And a restorer of homes. The old King James talks about, as I remember it, you would be called the repairer of the breach and a restorer of paths to dwell in. How many know the world has lost the paths of righteousness? And our shepherd leads us in the paths of righteousness to show the right way. Amen. To have a blessed life. Amen. So that's Isaiah 58. I think you get the gist of it. They were into the tick box religion. They were into just going through the motions, doing all the right things, the religious things, the things that the law of Moses and the ceremonial aspects, the moral aspects would require them to do. Well, at least the ceremonial. So they ticked all those boxes. But in the end, what they were doing was no good. It did them no good whatsoever. And it's interesting that you skip forward into New Testament times, into early church times, where you would think that in that move of God, that early church growing in the power of the Holy Spirit, were the early apostles still on the scene? You, you would think that churchianity was not a danger. But James, in his own inimitable style, he, he writes to them in chapter 1, verse 27, this is the New King James Version. I think we might have that one. James 1, 27. Listen to this. He says, pure. Everybody say, pure. pure. You could say unadulterated. Pure and undefiled religion. 
How many know most of us, the vast majority of us in this house are, are religious? That's not a bad thing, by the way. We're religious. But there's the right kind of religion and the wrong kind of religion. And I mean within Christianity. And he says, pure and undefiled religion before God. I want that. I, 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 I think that's where I better be. I better be practicing pure religion and undefiled. Amen? And it says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. To visit orphans and widows in their trouble. How many know there was a lot of localized persecution at that time? A lot of the men, the, the men had lost their lives. There was a lot of widows, a lot of orphans. And he says, he says that's pure and undefiled religion. is to visit orphans and widows in their trouble. There's two aspects. The second one is this. To keep oneself unspotted from the world. The world is a filthy place. It's the, the, the pigsty that the prodigal son was in. It stinks spiritually. In many, many different ways. And we have got to be very careful as we... Uh, in the world, but not of it, as we try to reach those people who are still in that place of needing Jesus, needing a Savior, that as we mix with them and rub shoulders with them, that we, we don't allow ourselves to become polluted, yeah? So there's two aspects to this, pure religion and undefiled. There's the outward expression. And isn't it interesting, that's the first one he mentions. He mentions, first of all, the outward expression. I just note that. I'm not going to build a theology on it. But I, I found that quite noteworthy. The outward expression was practical humanity towards people. It, it was literally not just, oh, hello, hello, Mrs. Newton. I, I've cut you, I know you're a widow. I, I've come for a visit. Hello. Yeah, bye. And then kind of, you know, tick box. This is genuine long-term care and concern. For people within the church and people outside the church. Old Bertha up your street there. Yeah, old Paddy, 86 with a bit of a limp walking past the door. Might not make it till next Christmas. Do you hear what I'm saying? There's, there's two dimensions within church and outside of church. That's doing that, part of, part of pure religion and undefiled is visiting the widows and the orphans and their affliction. Now, is that the totality? If we tick those two boxes, have we got it? No. This is speaking a bit. Think about the rest of Isaiah 58. Feed the hungry. Clothe the naked. You know, if it's appropriate, bring a homeless person in your home. We did in the last month. But I had to kind of assess it, risk assess it in my head. Because if you get kids, you've got to be extremely careful who you bring in there. Yeah? If you ever think about it, give me a call. I'll give you some directions. Personally, if I had little kids and it was a stranger, I wouldn't do it. You've got to be really wise. Amen. Yeah. Their first responsibility is towards their own families. But we can't, we, we can't just close the door on that and just say, oh, well, that doesn't apply to me. Isaiah 58 really, really matters because your options are churchianity or Christianity. Pure religion and undefiled is... Practical. It's practical. And to keep oneself unspotted from the world. You're, you're talking about holiness. 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 Pure thinking. Amen. Walking in righteousness. Discipline in the flesh. Keeping yourself right before God. Keeping short accounts with God that if we sin, we make use of the blood of Jesus and Jesus. Amen. It's interesting because when you look at the context of James 1.27, as you'll hear me say often in the Bible school, context is everything when you're interpreting the Bible. Not quite everything, but it's a huge part of it. You've got to take context into consideration. Let's look at the context. James 1, 22 to 27. So let's back up now and look at James 1, 22 to 27. And you will see that it's a warning against self-deception. And it reads this way. But be doers of the word. 
and not hearers only. You see, when you leave this building after I've preached this message, you can either do the word, pray about it, say, God, open up opportunities. Lord, open my eyes to any needs around about me or just leave (laughs) and just forget it. But in doing that and taking no action relative to the word of God, preached, read, YouTube, whatever, we end up deceiving ourselves. So he says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For anyone, for anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, and he goes away and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty, Paul picks the same idea up in 2 Corinthians 3. He who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, in other words, looking into the word of God, beholding the the, the image of God as in a mirror. And he says, it is not, and he's not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. And then he goes on, if anyone among you thinks he's religious, and does not bridle his tongue. There's got to be a change in the way we speak. Read the word. Read the New Testament. There's, there's, you've got to deal with swearing, lying, taking the, the Lord's name in vain. Do you, the number of Christians I hear saying, "Oh my God," just like the world. It might be an idea to read, read the Ten Commandments and see that commandment about taking the Lord's name in vain. The ancient Israelites wouldn't even mention his name. They found another name. You ever wondered why the, the word Lord is capitalized in one instance in your Bible and not capitalized in other instances? Check it out. He who doesn't bridle his tongue, he deceives his own heart. Do you see that? He deceives his own heart. There's that self-deception again. It says, listen to this. This is, this is, wow. He says, this one's religion is, it says here, useless. What is religion for? Religion is to, one would hope, make us right with the gods, if you're talking kind of broad spectrum about religion. Yeah? You would hope your religion's going to take you to heaven. That somehow your religion religion is dealing with your sins to appease the gods. (laughs) That's why we engage with religion, isn't it? Whatever whatever persuasion, whatever ethnic group you are. And one would hope that you pick up the Christian religion for all those ends. Chief end, to know God. Amen. But it says that if, 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 if we don't do the word of God and we're hearers only, it says this one's religion is useless. Wow. And then he says, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep one unspotted from the world. Amen. And if you read about the early church in the book of Acts, they practiced pure religion. In Acts chapter 6 verse 1, they had many, many widows that they needed to look after. And it says, Acts 6, 1, now, it says, now about this time when the number of disciples was increasing, a complaint was made by the Hellenists, these are Greek-speaking Jews, against the native Hebrew widows, because their widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of food. So it wasn't perfect, all right? And what did they do? They appointed seven deacons to look after that. So the widows mattered. Amen. And then in Acts chapter 11 and, and other places... I'll read, you, I'll read you one place. Romans chapter 15. Here's Paul in a very different role. Sometimes you think, well, may I roll robbers? I'm a teacher of the word. Don't ask me to be involved in warm welcome. That's not my gift. Then. Well, do you think fundraising was Paul's gifting? He says in Romans 15, 25 to 27, And and you look at how many passages refer to this offering he was taking up. 
He says, but for now, I'm going to Jerusalem to serve the saints, the Jewish believers. For the Gentile believers in Macedonia and Ikea have been pleased to make a contribution for the poor among the saints in Jerusalem. And they were pleased to do it. And they are indebted to them. For if the Gentiles have come to share in their spiritual things, then they're indebted to serve them with their tangible material things. And there's at least three other passages where Paul's speaking about this offering. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9. So here is Paul, great apostle. Paul the fundraiser. Wow. Do you hear what I'm saying? So obviously charity work is so, so important. But as I said last week, why are we doing it? Oh, Robert gets so much out of it. It really helps me in my mental health, you know. It's like, you know, it really does me good, this charity work. Hey, 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 that's the wrong focus. For Christians, it ought to flow out of God's heart of mercy for the others. I mentioned this last week, so you can get onto that as well. So this brings me on to a discussion about, Christ, sorry, about churchianity versus Christianity. Who's heard of that term, churchianity? Only three or four? Life has moved on, Pastor Freddie. The first I heard of it was, I think it was Billy Graham talked about a message of churchianity. I think it might even still be on YouTube. And uh, I, was, I, I kind of thought, okay, that's where it started back in the 50s. Well, I, I really delved into this term to find that the term churchianity, the first time I could find it used, was in 1789. So this issue of the church becoming the center and the totality of what people get involved in and the doctrines and the, the dogma at the expense of mercy and compassion, this has been going on probably all the way through the whole of church history. And we, if you know your church history, you know it has. One dictionary defines it as this way, and there's, there's many definitions, but it defines it as any practices of Christianity that are viewed as placing a larger emphasis on the habits of church life or the institutional traditions of the church than on theology and spiritual teachings of Jesus. It's the quality of being too church-focused. That term, churchianity, was used again by a preacher um, sorry, by, by an author, a Christian author called Edwin Paxton Hood, and uh, in a book that he published in 1852. And I'll just quote from this. He says, Christianity means the religion where Christ is all. Churchianity is the religion where the church is all. <laughs> and then in 2002, in his book, Keeping Sane in a Crazy World, Charles Jenkins wrote, the priest and the Levite, so the story of the Good Samaritan. The priest and the Levite represents churchly movements, denominations, movements. They represented churchianity that is powerless to lift suffering humanity. Suffering humanity. And Pastor Freddy talked about this, this year is the year of lifting people up. But as he says here, it says... That churchianity is powerless to lift suffering humanity because it ignores Christ. It's lost focus in Christ. It's lost its heart. That's the problem with Isaiah 58. They lost the heart of God. And it says, what is, he says, Charles Jenkins says, what is wrong with the world today is that we have too much churchianity and too little Christianity. And you might say, well, why are you preaching this at Suncoast, Suncoast Church? Because I believe there's a danger for every church to fall into this. And to be, if I can be brutally honest, whereas this church has probably, I would say, done a reasonably good job at responding to international needs. Widows, drug addicts in different countries. We support Hope House over there in Bangladesh where there's 70 Orphans, abandoned kids out there. When it comes to the international front, I, I, I think we've done a reasonable job. There's, there's, there's always more. But when it comes for this local church acting locally, we've tended 
to either operate through other churches or in the main other agencies. And we've donated to many other agencies and towns over the years. And we've, we've released volunteers to various church initiatives, various things like street pastors, for example. But when it comes to us getting our hands dirty locally, mmm, do you hear what I'm saying? And I'm just amazed how we had already embraced the idea of a warm welcome to this community. Because as I'm preaching this, man, I'll tell you, if we hadn't, and I'm preaching this, I would feel a great big finger pointing back at me. A big finger saying, hypocrite. Do you hear what I'm saying? Now, we've done stuff over the years locally, but it's been a while. And I know there's been COVID, but let's not excuse ourselves. Do you hear what I'm saying? So the danger of that is if it's not happening locally through our local church, it, it, or it hasn't been to the place where I think it should have had, I've had a bit of repenting to do, um, then what will happen is the need for reaching your neighbor is somewhat diminished, yeah? Because we're not practicing it corporately. There's less of, an, less of a, a kind of awareness at an individual level. Are you with me? It's not to say that there's a, not a lot of us doing, you know, looking after our neighbors and doing different things. But I'm just saying as a church, I think it, this year is, a, is a, a very pivotal time. And what I, want, what I think God is going to do for the sake of souls here in Eastbourne, the ones that need salvation, it's not just about preaching the gospel. It's about backing that message up with the works of Christ. Do you, do you hear what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's not just about, well, I've preached a message. We've done all I can. They didn't respond or a few did. We've done, job done. No, Isaiah 58 says, do all that stuff. Then your light will arise in darkness. And there's a lot of darkness. But what will cause our light to shine is if we're not just preaching the gospel, but living it. Do, do you hear what I'm saying? Just conscious of the time. Are you with me? So churchianity is defined by gotquestions.com. Anybody been on that website? Okay, a lot of it's good stuff. There's other questions they answer. I, I don't agree with some of their takes, but this, they nailed it. They define churchianity. Churchianity is attractive to those who don't know their Bibles. Churchianity assures people that they're right with God because they listen to sermons or keep certain rules or attend meetings in a church building. Churchianity produces nominal Christians who fall under the same condemnation as the religious leaders of Jesus and Isaiah's day. And then they quote Isaiah and quote Jesus who's quoting Isaiah. <laughs> These people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain. Remember what James said? This man's religion is useless. Their teachings are merely human rules. Still quoting Isaiah. It goes on. You have let go, Jesus said this, you have let go of the commandments of God and are holding on to human traditions. That's what can happen in church life. And, he, and Jesus finished this up by saying, you have a fine way of setting aside the commandments of God in order to observe your own traditions. There are some churches, there's nothing but tradition. And, and trying to find the truth that would get a soul saved in the middle of all the, the ceremony and the, the, the things that they do and the traditions and the rituals they keep. But what about the gospel? I'll just close this just with some brief comments on churchianity in Jesus' day. You might say, well, the, the church wasn't existing in Jesus' day. Just think of the broader church of his Old Testament people, okay? In Jesus' day, there was a group of religious people called the Pharisees. And there was another sect called the Sadducees. And they were the ruling religious class. And within their midst, they had lawyers. Not lawyers as we understand them, but people who were specialists in the Mosaic law. Yep. The application of everything that was handed down in the Torah, the law of Moses. And then there were scribes who would write all that up. So these guys were specialists. You would think that they got it right, yeah? You would think they'd have it down pat. But they too were into churchianity. 
And Jesus condemned them time and again because of their heartlessness. And if you read Matthew 23, Matthew 23, read the thing, it's got eight woes in it. Woe to you Pharisees, he says. Oh man, how would you like to be in the receiving end of that? In Mark 7, verses 6 through 8, Jesus replies to them. He says, rightly did Isaiah prophesy about you hypocrites. Wow, he didn't mince words. He says, as it is written in scripture, and and I've already quoted this, these people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching the precepts of men as doctrines. Matthew 9, verses 9 through 13. This This is Matthew The call of Matthew to be one of Jesus' disciples. Look at lesson number one for Matthew. Look what happened. It says here, as Jesus was walking along, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at his tax collector's booth. Tax collectors were regarded as the scum of the earth in those days. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Matthew got up and followed him. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home as dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. But when the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Which is the New Living Translation, which is pretty close to the mark. Have you known Jesus came for the scum? I don't know about you, but I was scum. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. And then he added, listen to this, then he added, now go, not to Matthew, but to the Pharisees, he says, now go and learn the meaning of this scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. Now, does he mean dispense with a whole ceremonial sacrificial system? No, he's saying, guys, okay, you got that. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy. They were thinking scum. Jesus saying, this is who I came for. You you hear? I hope there's nobody we regard as scum. The very person you might regard as scum is the very one that Jesus came for. And whereas you might avoid them, Jesus would host a dinner party for them. You see, that's the two mentalities. One is churchianity, one is Christianity. And I just think there's room within this church for a change, a change of mindset. Because as I said, this tendency towards self-deception gradually to churchianity is something that affects us all. Matthew 23 verses 1 to 4. This is the chapter with the eight woes. I'm just going to give you some excerpts. 23 verse 1 to 4, it says, Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees have seated themselves in Moses' chair of authority as teachers of the law. So practice and observe everything they tell you as far as that's concerned, yeah? Jesus came to fulfill the law. He expected these people also to do their best to fulfill the law. Okay, So he's not chucking the law out. He came to fulfill it. But what he does say, it says, so practice and observe everything they tell you, but do not do as they do. For they preach things, but don't practice them. Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Verse 4, and the scribes and the Pharisees tie up heavy loads that are hard to bear regulations concerning the Sabbath that weren't even in the Torah. Rules and regulations galore. They would make the EU look like... The scribes and the Pharisees tie up heavy loads and place them in men's shoulders, but they themselves will not lift a finger to make them lighter. And here, I'll give you one woe, a a taste of all the other eight woes. This is Jesus speaking to religious people who practice churchianity. This is his attitude. He says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you give a tenth or a tithe of your mint and your dill and your cumin, in other words, focusing on minor matters, 
And you've neglected the weightier, more important moral and spiritual provisions of the law, i.e. justice and mercy and faithfulness. For these are the primary things you ought to have done without neglecting the others. So there they are measuring their 10% of their cumin. They've got their little teaspoon out, like I do when I'm making lentil curry. I get my, tea, get my cumin, little jar of cumin, get the little teaspoon out. Yes, exactly one teaspoon. You see, we can be like that too. Did that last week. Didn't we? we can be like that too. Every now, I mean, Julie and I have tithed our income from the third week after our salvation. We've tithed on everything. Always have, always will. I know it's not part of the law. We have redeemed from that. I do it for another reason, which I won't unpack. I like to follow Father Abraham and his grandson. I do it out of sheer, sheer gratitude is why I tithe. I do not tithe because I feel my finances be cursed if I don't. Because Christ redeemed me from the curse of the law. I've been quite a journey with this over the last few years. I used to preach that tithing message and I think, that is just, that is just utter legalism. There is not a single requirement in the New Testament where it says that Gentiles need to tithe or be circumcised. Aren't you glad of that one, guys? So for me, we just tithe out of sheer gratitude. But here's the, here's the, here's the little trap, guys. 10% every week, 10%, 10%, 10%, 10%. 10%. What if God's saying more? We give a lot more than that. <laughs> you see, it can become so easily another little tick box. And we don't even take offerings up in this church. And sometimes I think we might need to stop John every now and again and just spend one of these mornings just, even though we don't take up an offering, is just say, Lord, yeah, whatever we've given online, we just, that's our life. We, we work for that. We do it for you, Jesus. You know, I've just thought about that this morning, actually. Are you with me? So Matthew 22, 23, we just read it. So nearly finished. You can see from all these scriptures taken together, Old Testament, Jesus' day, new, uh, early church, we can see there's a need for God's people in every age to avoid the trappings of churchianity, to avoid passing by on the other side of the road, ignoring the needs of those around us. There was the Levite and the priest that passed by. Let's, over this next month, and as John was saying this morning, let's look beyond the month, but let's look inwardly over this month of fasting and be open to what the Lord may reveal in our hearts. Even as you revealed to me just over the last six months or so, I thought, we need to do more locally. Uh, you hear what I'm saying? I felt, God, I need, I, need, I need to get your hands dirty more locally. Let's pray for more of his heart of mercy and compassion. And let's ask him to open our eyes to opportunities to represent him to the hurting and the needy around about us. Amen. Maybe we might need to ask the Lord in his mercy to forgive us when we find that we've kind of moved a bit in the shades of churchianity. We might need to ask him to forgive us if we've tended towards that. If we've lost the heart of Christ and the love of his presence. And just finally, we might need to ask God to soften our heart. Because churchianity gradually will harden our hearts. And read Hebrews 2, 3, and 4 about warnings of a hard heart. You know, I've watched my wife often doing her nails and doing her toenails. I don't touch my toenails. But I see you there with all the apparatus, you know, and part of the apparatus is a pumice stone. You know what a pumice stone is? And it's to rub off calluses. You should sit now. <laughs> and, you know, I've, I've watched this pumice stone going out to smooth the skin of the heel, you know. 
to smooth the ball of a big toe. And I, I thought, thank God I'm a guy. <laughs> Sometimes I wake up because the roughness of the skin in my, my heel digs into my, my foot and my leg in the middle of the night. The skin's so rough. But you know, you know I, I kind of was sitting there reflecting on this the other day and uh, I suddenly thought, Lord, you've given, East, you've given Suncoast Church a big pumice stone to rub away any calluses on our heart. And that pumice stone, in part, but a large part, is all the 30 Iranian Christians who now come to this church. And the indication of whether you need that pumice stone or not is measured by how much interaction have you had with them over these last two years. In part, and I know some of us might have issues, still working through some stuff. How long are you going to take for some of us? The best thing to do when you find these kind of issues in you, I had them by the truckload. But I also know what Christ said about loving people. And there's something so therapeutic, so healing, so much causes us to break through when we just do it. When we just do it. And we just... Do it! <laughs> Are you with me? And I've thanked the Lord the last two years for somehow he dialed Suncoast Church's number and sent all the Persians here. Well, nearly all of them. As a great big pumice stone that we can either say, I don't need it, thank you. I've such a heart of mercy and compassion. Or we can say, oh, gee, you wouldn't even think it. You know, those with a, heart, a right heart don't even think about that. They just do it. Oh, g'day. How you doing? How you doing? Do you hear what I'm saying? Great big pumice stone. What have you done with God's pumice stone this last two years? They've been amongst us two years now. Or oh, I find it difficult to talk. Do it. What does it cost you to go up and say hello and shake a hand? Yeah. See what I'm saying? Do you know what's really blown me away this year? Is, is the people who have embraced them wholeheartedly, invited them into their homes, had a great laugh with them. It's really, really surprised me. It's the Barrys and the Beryls. It's the Morrises and the Annabelles. It's the Roger and the Joys, who are all over. Better be careful here. They're all over. Fifty. Did I stretch it to sixty? Seventy? And I, I've, I've said to Jesus, I thought that would be the generation that would have issues. Johnny Foreigner. Do you hear what I'm saying? But it's the generation that has most, I would say, no, I'm, I'm just speaking generally here. Thank God for young Ben Horan. Took them to Laser Quest, the young ones. Thanks, Ben. We were, we were sitting having a cup of the other day and I thought, I'd love to take them do something and enrich their young lives while they're waiting for a year, you know. Ben already thought about it. He's from the younger generation. But what about you and I? No matter what role you fulfill, no matter what gift you have, let's get our hands dirty this year. Yeah. <laughs> Both from the people within, your neighbours up the road, the wall, opposite the wall. Man, I'll tell you, there's some characters in the wall opposite me.
Earlier this year, there was five women in five different flats all at it. Well, I'll rip your face off. I'll come down there. Well, what are you going to do with it? We're really at it. Five of them. I'm going. I'm running to my basement. Come, let's stand. Let's stand. Let's stand. <laughs> oh, wow. Let's close our eyes, eh? Does anybody need to say to Jesus, Oh, Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. Oh, thank you for that message this morning. Forgive me, Lord. Lord, I can't speak for every individual here on an individual basis. That's their conversation with you. But Lord, I can speak for the whole church here. And Father, I pray that you would forgive us of what we would call the sins of omission. What we could have done, but didn't. Not just what we did that was wrong, but what we could have done that would have been right, but we didn't do it. So Father, I ask for you to forgive us as we go into tomorrow distributing leaflets to a community, and maybe not any of them would come. But it's still nice for them to hear that we care. So, Father, we pray that you'd help us to get our hands dirty. Open our eyes to opportunities to help the hurting and the needy around about us. We thank you for the the finances you've given this church that we've been able to help other groups in this town to do just that. We thank you for the measure that You've enabled us to do with a food bank, and etc. But Lord, I just think you're asking us to do more. More of your works. So Lord, please preserve us from churchianity at some coast. We love theology, Lord. We love the study of God. We love good preaching. We love a good book and meeting together and joining together. But Lord, preserve us from churchianity and keep us, Lord, in pure religion and undefiled of doing all the things for humanity that we see need doing as well as keeping ourselves unspotted from the world. And we ask you for your grace And your mercy to make that happen in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen and amen.